morning, everyone. So we are going to get started. Um, for those of you who don't know, my name is Tanya Cantlaw. I'm the acting counsel to Brooklyn Borough President Eric L. Adams. And today is our Borough Service Cabinet meeting with all of our agencies and the district managers. We have two presentations today. Before we have the presentations, I'll just take the roll. 311, Administration for Children's Services. Present. Brooklyn Public Library. Commission on Human Rights. Con Edison. Department for the Aging. Department of Buildings. Present. Department of City Planning. DCAS. Department of Consumer Affairs, Department of Corrections, Department of Developmental Disabilities, Department of Design and Construction, Department of Environmental Protection, Department of Finance, Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, Present. Department of Homeless Services, Department of Housing Preservation and Development, Department of Information Technology and Telecommunications. Department of Parks and Recreation. Department of Probation. Department of Sanitation. Present. Department of Transportation. Present. Department of Youth and Community Development. Fire Department. Human Resources Administration. Mayor's Office. National Grid, New York City Housing Authority, New York City Transit, Office of Management Budget, Office of Emergency Management, Police Department, Small Business Services, U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development, U.S. Coastal Service, Verizon, now for the community boards, community board one, community board two. Here. Community board three. Here. Community board four. Present. Community board five. Community board six. Here. Community board seven. Community board eight. Community board nine. Community board 10. Present. Community board 11. Here. Community board 12. Here. Community Board 13. Here. Community Board 14. Here. Community Board 15. Present. Community Board 16. Here. Community Board 17. And Community Board 18. Okay. So our first presentation is Department of Transportation and they will be presenting on the elect electric vehicle charging initiatives. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, good morning. I'm Will Carey uh, from the New York City Department of Transportation. Uh, good morning. I'm Jen Robertson, Mayor's Office of Sustainability. Uh, thanks, everyone, uh, for having us today. Uh, we're here to give a informational uh, presentation on some exciting programs that we have around uh, electric vehicles. And uh, I'm going to give it to Jen uh, to start us off. Great. Thanks, Will. Uh, so Mayor's Office of Sustainability, our main mandate is the reduction of greenhouse gas emissions and we're here today to talk to you about some programming that we're doing in transportation to address those, those needs. Um, is there a, a clicker or, oh, thank you. Let's see if I can figure out how to use this. Oh, there we go. Uh, great. So I'll start us off with some background on uh, our greenhouse gas emission profile. Uh, right now we know that transportation is the second highest emitter of greenhouse gas emissions in New York City after buildings. Transportation accounts for around 30% of emissions, and we've recommitted to the Paris Climate Agreement at New York City. So we really want to be part of the movement to be reducing our emissions to combat climate change. Uh, on the slide here, which I believe should be page three on your handouts, 
It basically shows where transportation is in our greenhouse gas emission inventory citywide. And the pie graph next to that, the green one there, shows you the impact of passenger vehicles within transportation. So surprisingly, passenger vehicles is actually the bulk of our on-road transportation greenhouse gas emissions. I'm surprised by this as someone who you know, lives in Brooklyn, takes transit all the time, rides my bike all the time. But when you think of folks, you know, if I'm going up to the Bronx to visit friends or our family members, I'm probably going to hop in a car to go over a train. So this is really where we're seeing emissions drive up. Uh, we know that the bulk of our emissions actually come from trips that begin and end in the outer boroughs in transportation. The, the next page there, it shows the modeling that we did for our 80 by 50 plan. The part that we circled, the, the red circle there, shows the impact that electric vehicles could have in reducing our emissions. So we know that if we were to adopt low carbon fuels, notably electric vehicles, we could see a 13% reduction in our transportation related emissions, which is a huge impact. Uh, we know that electric vehicles could be a, a really big driver of reducing emissions. Uh, the mayor is uh, committed to a 20% vehicle registration rate of electric vehicles by 2025 in order to be working towards the goal of having this reduction take place. No. Next slide here. So why we're really into electric vehicles, we know that there are more models available in the United States. Over 30 models of electric vehicles are available to New Yorkers. We know that the prices of the vehicles are falling. You can get an electric vehicle for under $30,000 after uh, all the incentives are in place for a new vehicle. A used vehicle is significantly less expensive, and we're seeing a used EV market continuing to grow. Uh, we see the ranges of the vehicles are increasing, so you can go 200 miles or more on a single charge, so comparable to a lot of gasoline vehicles. And uh, we see that sales are already growing. So there's a 46% growth that took place between 2016 and 2017 in New York City alone. Where we're seeing a barrier, though, is the number of New Yorkers who park on street. So we know that half of New Yorkers park at least one car on street. They don't have an, a driveway or garage to charge their vehicle. So a lot of the initiatives that DOT will be speaking to will be addressing the need. So uh, next page here, uh, EV charging, kind of how it works. I'll just run through the three different styles of charging that exist. And, go through the one-on-one -on, -one on what they kind of look like and what they mean for New Yorkers. Uh, a level one charge, the first kind of column there, um, that's just a normal wall outlet you probably have in a room like this. It's uh, 120 volts, you can plug it in. If you have a garage or driveway, it's a great way to charge up your car. Often the cable comes with the car if you buy it new or used, you can just plug it in there. 12 hours is a long time, but if you're, you know, if you're driving maybe five to 10 miles a day, you're charging every night, it can meet a lot of your needs. The level two charge, the next column over, that's um, 240 volts or so, that's comparable to the amount of power you'd get from like a dryer. So if you were to install it in your house, definitely more, uh, more load on your, on your bill there compared to the level one charge, but not that much more. And you, know, you can charge maybe a few times a week as opposed to every day that way, and it's a bit more convenient because it charges the car in four to five hours. Uh, this is also a great use for maybe a uh, workplace. If you drive to work, if you have a charger there, you're at work for four to seven hours probably, it's a great way to charge up your car uh, if you're gonna be at a, a location for a fair amount of time. Uh, and the level three charge, or a fast charge, that is uh, 480 volts or more. This is a super fast charge, half an hour for a, a majority charge on your vehicle. And this is really, I, I need a charge right now. Maybe I'm about to go on a really long trip and I wasn't able to charge earlier in the day. Uh, more of a gas station experience. Uh, that would be the, the way I would describe it. So these are the three different levels that we'll be speaking to. Go to the next page here. So I'll just wrap it up before I hand it over to, to DOT and what the city's currently doing on the EV portfolio. Uh, so we have New York City Clean Fleet, which we're super proud to say we're uh, over 1,700 electric vehicles in our fleet. Uh, we have a goal of having 2,000 electric vehicles in our fleet by 2025. We're probably going to meet that this year, which is exciting. We're going to meet a goal early, I hope, so that's super exciting for, for me to say. Uh, so that's uh, kind of ongoing. We do have electric vehicle chargers available in DOT lots and garages. There are, I believe, 39 chargers total in uh, lots and garages uh, across all five boroughs. And there's also an electric vehicle advisory committee that the DOT convenes. And there are a few pilot programs as well, but with that, I'll hand it over to my colleague, Will. Uh, thanks, Jen. I also want to um, recognize we have some colleagues here from uh, Con Ed uh, who have joined us today. So um, I'm going to speak about uh, two exciting projects that uh, DOT is working with the mayor's office and uh, with Con Ed on. Um, and we're, we're seeking to get uh, feedback um, from a variety of stakeholders. Um, the first is the city's first curbside 
level two charging program. Uh, in partnership with Con Ed, we will be installing 120 level two chargers uh, at on-street locations across the five boroughs. And Con Ed is uh, funding this project uh, through a state um, renewable energy fund. Um, and the purpose here is really to test this model. It's the first time we're doing it, uh, to see how people use it um, and to see how it could inform uh, a future rollout. Um, most of these chargers, about 100, will be publicly available. A smaller share, about 20, uh, will serve the city's own fleet. So what, what is curbside charging and, and what does it look like? So on the, on the slide you see a, uh, a simple rendering of what the charger looks like. Um, basically you drive your vehicle up and you activate the charger with your phone or with a tap card. Um, you unplug it and then you plug it into your, uh, your own vehicle and then it locks into place so someone can't just come and yank it out. And um, if you see there's sort of a pulley at the top of, uh, of the charger, that's the same kind of system that you would see in a gas station. Um, and that's basically to make sure that the cord uh, doesn't drag across uh, uh, the, the ground and that there's less of a tripping hazard. Um, we are in the midst right now of our uh, community engagement process. Um, and. Um, we have met with, uh, oh, Felicia, how many meetings have we done? I think we've done, this is close to our 30th, maybe our 30th meeting. Uh, we've met with uh, other um, borough uh, service cabinets and borough boards. We've met with um, um, the borough president, Adams. Uh, we've met with a number of city council members and other elected officials um, to sort of get their feedback on this project and sort of see um, what areas of the city might be interested in being part of the pilot program. We've also, also launched a feedback portal on the DOD website uh, where members of the public can go and learn about the project as well as um, suggest areas that might be well suited for charging. Um, and that portal is live. Um, and then uh, once we take all this information and we combine it with analysis that we're doing about where there might be demand for this kind of charging. We'll be announcing a set of um, pilot neighborhoods later in the spring um, and then working with those specific communities to finalize the specific sites where we'll be locating uh, these chargers. Um, so in terms of our next steps, we're getting Public Design Commission approval for the chargers. Um, we're in the process of creating a new curb regulation um, obviously this will be a new kind of parking, um, so we're creating an EV charging only regulation and that uh, hopefully will, uh, is going through the, the rule making process right now. We're doing our outreach um, and then we plan to, uh, to begin um, actual installation with our partners in Con Ed uh, later in the spring of this year. Just some uh, the second project that I wanted to talk about is um, the fast charging project. Um, as Jen mentioned, level two, the curbside, is a good charging solution. If you have, say, between two and four hours, you can get a top up on your battery. But sometimes we know that people with electric vehicles, they're going to need a faster charge. They're going on a long trip, or maybe they forgot to charge the night before. They're going to want the safety and security of knowing that they can go someplace and get a full charge. So it's more like a gas station model where you can get a full charge, or excuse me, an 80% charge in about 30 minutes or less. Um, so the mayor has committed um, to creating a network of 50 of these chargers across the city by 2020 um, and has allocated 10 million in capital funding towards it. Um, we're starting by uh, just looking at creating one station, one fast charging station in each borough. Um, so each of these stations would include about four of these fast chargers um, plus probably two level two chargers on the side. Um, we're going to be forward thinking, we're going to make sure this technology is changing that we'll be able to um, put in the most advanced chargers uh, as they become available. And we're looking for sites 
uh, that are accessible 24 hours a day um, and where there's some amenities. So while you're waiting that 30 minutes for your vehicle to charge, you can go get a cup of coffee or um, uh, you know, what have you. Uh, and this is also, this project will also be subject to public design review. Um, so in terms of potential sites, we're looking at DOT uh, lots and garages. This is the network of um, several dozen uh, parking facilities that we operate across the city. Um, and we'll be doing this first five, again, one site in, uh, in each borough, uh, probably uh, on those types of sites. So uh, again, uh, in terms of our next step, Doing our outreach, uh, we're talking to the Public Design Commission, and then we plan to um, announce our first set of sites uh, later this spring. Do you want to talk about this super quick? So in terms of uh, current legislation that the Mayor's Office is looking at, in 2013 we passed Local Law 130, which mandates that new parking garages need to be what we consider uh, EV ready. So it looks like when the garage or lot is built, they put in the electrical capacity and the conduit <coughs> necessary to install electric vehicle charging at 20% of the parking spots. Uh, this trenching and installation of conduits is the most expensive part of installing EV chargers, so doing this from the outset when you're already uh, you know, install, uh, installing asphalt makes a lot of sense. Uh, our goal is to pass a bill, um, which we've drafted and are hoping to bring to council sometime this week, um, that would be making these requirements more stringent. So it would look like 40% of new parking lots and garages or significantly renovated parking lots and garages would have that conduit and electrical space, and half of those would have some of those level two chargers. Uh, so we're really hoping to create an ecosystem of electric vehicle charging citywide and leveraging kind of private investments as well as public investments are really what we're looking at right now. Um, and with that, uh, to talk about this. so I just uh, we just circulated a handout. Uh, it's got some basic information covering what we just spoke about, as well as the web links. If you're interested in checking out the uh, the feedback portal, uh, that's on here. Um, it's also uh, on the last page of your handout. Uh, we're happy to take any questions at this point. Me? Yeah. Okay. Um, Sean Campbell from King Weber to 14. I'm just trying to get a, um, a, a clearer picture of how many charging stations you plan to install, how many you think need to be installed to incentivize enough EV car ownership to hit that 13% target, and whether all of this projection is based on holding the number of cars owned now as a steady number. So right now there are about 1.8 million registered uh, private vehicles in New York City, a number that has actually been, that was stable for many years, it's actually creeping upward slightly. Um, uh, we are doing some analysis on what it would take um, if you had 20% of those 1.8 million vehicles be um, uh, electric. Uh, what it would take to charge all of them, and it's a lot more than the 120 chargers that we're, we're talking about right now. Um, so we are doing that work. I think that the thing we're focusing on with this first 120 is just, um, it's the first time we're doing this. So we want to get it right. Um, we want to figure out um, uh, the community outreach piece. We want to figure out um, the design piece, and we want to figure out how New Yorkers actually uh, use and interact with these new chargers. Did I answer your question? Yeah, for the most part. Thanks. Um, I, uh, my name is Eddie Mark. I'm with uh, CB13. Uh, I'm just wondering how much is it going to be costing per charge? Is it like it's going right as gasoline or is it, you know, because I can see someone parking there for four hours is cheaper than the parking lot and just leaving there and doing, you know, the errands for the whole day, you know. So, what? Well, how much is it? Uh, we definitely agree with you. We want these spots to be used, and we want them to be used by vehicles that are actively mm -hmm. charging. So, you know, we're talking to our colleagues in Con Ed about um, a, a pricing strategy that will help to achieve that. Uh, on the one hand, um, we want this to be an affordable charging option. So, the idea is for it to be price competitive with gasoline. Um, 
Um, in addition, we want to make sure that like, if someone has finished their charging session, um, that they're incentivized uh, to, to move their vehicle. So that could be that they get a text message uh, when their charging session's up, saying, hey, you got 30 minutes to go and move your car, and then maybe after that you continue to get uh, charged. But we're, those are the sort of strategies that we're, we're talking to Conant about right now. Uh, Mike Rassiopo, CB6. Um, I just have a question. I saw a picture from the event uh, at Whole Foods. So I was wondering, you know, on a private, do you, have you worked with Whole Foods or any other similar examples to see what their numbers are? Because that's in CB6. I don't, and I go to Whole Foods sometimes, I don't really see cars, but that's, of course, anecdotal, so I don't know. So they have, they don't have a fast charger, they have a level two charger, more maybe one or two. Anecdotally, we know that from, from I know from my neighbor who owns an EV, that it's where he goes to charge. Yeah. Um, but um, you're, you're correct, so like, uh, in order to get to that 20% uh, EV number, we're going to need to look at all different kinds of strategies, including partnering with uh, Dwayne Reed that maybe has a, a parking lot. Could they put a charger there, uh, attract someone with an EV to go charge, they go shop, they buy their stuff at Dwayne Reed. I guess, uh, I guess I had, would you know, and I don't know if Whole Foods has to share this with you, but uh, has it worked out for, like, has, mm -hmm. has that worked for them? Uh, anecdotally, yeah. yes. I didn't know if you have any. Uh, and it, it certainly fits in with their image as sort of like yeah. a green conscious. Uh, I, a I, I, a week, I, we could certainly reach out to them and, and ask them how often it gets used. Hi, Barry Spitzer, uh, Community Board 12. Um, I got a couple of questions. Um, are you, in your plan, you're, you're looking to have charging stations on, on the street? On the curb, yes, sir. On the curb. Um, and this is going to be a new parking regulation? It is. And um, have you looked at putting these charging stations in places where already existing parking regulations are instead of creating new parking regulations? We are. OK. Um, and um, how about uh, have you looked at putting these charging stations in like existing gas stations? where it wouldn't take up parking on the street? Uh, this is another area that we are exploring um, of engaging with those private entities, be they retail stores that have uh, a parking lot attached to them. Um, it's, a little, uh, uh, it's a little bit of a longer process with them, and I think gas stations may be a more appropriate location for the fast charging, where you go, you, you stay for like 20, 30 minutes, and then you leave. Whereas the curbside is meant to serve people who uh, live in the neighborhood and have an EV and say they drive to work, they come home from work, they, they don't have their own garage uh, or parking or, or um, driveway so they can charge overnight on street. So basically somebody who has an electric car will be provided the parking by the city. Um, and that person who also doesn't have a, a uh, garage or a driveway uh, will lose sp space and won't have where to park because somebody's charging their car or will maybe charge their car. And, and um, my point is that the gas stations are already um, strategically located next to, uh, um, next to uh, highways, parkways, um, and you mentioned amenities before, some of them do have um, you know, like when you can go in and grab a cup of coffee and stuff like that, it just seems like um, that would be the logical uh, way to go. Like they're set up for this kind of stuff already, for for getting uh, fuel or um, electricity into your car rather than going on residential streets and taking up uh, space. So we're looking at putting these in a variety of different contexts, again, to sort of meet people, I, I, to, to serve people where they end up parking. Um, and that could be on a street that currently has meters. Uh, so it could be metered during the day, so you have someone comes and shops for two hours and they charge, and then a resident who has an EV could then come and do overnight charging there. Um, it could be in parking spaces that are located under elevated structures, like under the BQE or under the Gowanus. 
Um, and it could also be on a, on a residential street. I think we're going to be strategic about this. So we're not, we're not going to be flooding one residential block with you know, taking 10 spaces. Uh, I think we're, you know, we realize that obviously there's high parking demand. Um, but we do think that this can be a shared resource um, that can benefit a lot of uh, Brooklynites, including the increasing number of Brooklynites who own electric vehicles. Yes, I agree. I just you know, would like to, um, we have 8 million people in the city, and this will benefit 1.8. Right. So trying to balance the needs of the other uh, New Yorkers versus a very small portion of them. And I understand that it's growing, but uh, just uh, thinking, coming from a district that has zero parking, I'm just, I'm just uh, very uh, uh, apprehensive, let's just say, about taking away parking spots. Um, and just uh, one last question. Um, so, so this program is trying to build, build up the, uh, the feasibility of somebody who is maybe looking to buy an electric vehicle. Um, so my question is, is the city working, let's say, with, with the state as well? Because uh, I'm just saying for me personally, I wouldn't get an electric vehicle unless I know that when I travel on New York State Thruway, I will find a charger. So is the city talking, let's say, to the, to the state DOT to see you know, if we can expand the, the, the program you know, for, for the 200 miles? So uh, right now, NYPA is investing $250 million. That's the New York Power. New York Power, sorry. That was my life, and I can apply apologies. That's okay. Uh, they, yeah, so they're investing uh, $250 million in charging on throughways. So we'll be speaking to that need exactly. So they're looking at doing a statewide ecosystem of fast charging, and then New York Citywide, we're doing a mixture of slow and fast charging to meet different needs. Okay. Thank you. Appreciate it. Um, sorry, there's just a lot to tease out here, but I, I'm, when you talk about the analysis of liking, likely charging demand and geographic diversity, I'm wondering so what the criteria is, are in the, um, um, the analysis of likely um, um, use. Uh, the first thing is the number of people who currently own electric vehicles. Um, the second thing is uh, looking at some parking characteristics, so seeing neighborhoods that uh, where a large proportion of car owners park on street. Uh, and then also looking at um, some sort of density of car ownership. So like how many cars are there, period. Uh, so those kinds of neighborhoods uh, are often the ones that we're looking at for the curbside program. And you're seeing already some geographic diversity in, in those patterns? Or, and are you seeking to ensure that geographic diversity also includes socioeconomic diversity? Uh, we are. Uh, we're looking um, to be um, probably in at least three to four boroughs. Um, so we want to get a spread across the city. And uh, we would also like to be in um, neighborhoods that are socioeconomically diverse. Um, has this been considered uh, with regards to anything like car share? Because I know we've got a bunch of car. I think we're one of the spot. CB6, I know, is one of the areas where... Uh, that program has been piloted, and it seems like since you can't use other cars, there's been, and I don't know what was enforced with regards to the car rental companies, but that seems like a space where if you want to incentivize uh, electric car ownership, or at least, sorry, electric car uh, usership, in this case, renter, uh, have, has there been any discussions with that, with the car share programs? Because these are places that are no longer private. You can't, you can't park a private car there any longer, so it seems like a natural place uh, we agree, and we're engaging both of the, the current two partners, Enterprise and Zipcar, and in, in that discussion mm -hmm. to see if they have interest in piloting some uh, EVs in the New York City market. My concern is the design. It looks like a vandal's dream. I'm a little concerned that kids will hang from these ropes. That you, I mean, I'm assuming this is what it's going to look like. Uh, that is correct. And if you're putting it under the guanas or under dark places, I'm just concerned that, you know, someone could get hurt, someone could, you know. Uh, so the company that, uh, that makes the chargers is a Canadian company um, that has, uh, I think, R8, how many in, in the field right now? 600. That is 600 in the field, including in, uh, in Montreal, uh, where they've been, uh, you know, field tested for vandalism.
cold weather, uh, for collision, um, and they've held up. Uh, they've held up quite well. Okay. So, uh, it's certainly uh, it's a concern we share whenever we put a new piece of street furniture out there that someone's going to try to graffiti it or take a bat to it. Um, and and so uh, we've been uh, talking a lot about that issue with uh, with the company. Would, would you be able to provide a list in Montreal where I can go see one? Sure. Any more questions? Okay. Actually, I had a question. So have you had hearings, or do you plan to have hearings, I guess, to hear the community's concern? I'm just sort of echoing Barry's concern. So uh, again, right now we're kind of in this outreach phase where we're talking, uh, I believe we still have the Manhattan Borough Board to go. Um, and we're also meeting with many council members. Uh, and based on that input, plus the input from the feedback portal, plus um, our analysis, we plan to come up with these, this list of short list of potential pilot neighborhoods. And at that point, we'll do further outreach to those communities. Thank you so much for your time. Sure. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. And our next and final presentation is the U.S. Census Bureau, Zakira Ahmed. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Um, my name is Zakir Ahmed. I'm from the United States Census Bureau. First of all, I want to thank all of you for coming out in this weather. And I want to thank um, Brooklyn Borough President for inviting um, and Tanya, you know, for organizing all these and um, allow, um, inviting us. <coughs> so um, I am here today to talk about the 2020 Census. Um, as most of you know, that Census Bureau is the leading source of data for our nation, um, and we do um, we do surveys throughout the year. And um, how does this thing work? <laughs> oh, this one. Okay. To the right. Okay. Um, so. Um, Beside the 2020 census or the decennial census that we do every 10 years, we do other surveys throughout the year. One of them is American Community Survey. Um, some of you might receive it in your house. It's a long survey where we ask a lot of questions about, you know, people say, why do they ask so many personal questions? We gather all those data to, and provide those to, the, to our government to make policies. Um, there is another survey uh, we call current population survey where you hear every month if the unemployment rate went up or went down. That's also another survey that we do throughout the year. Um, American housing survey where we find out um, the quality of housing in the United States um, and um, uh, provide that. And also we have economic census and census of government. So the 20 decennial census is mandated by U.S. Constitution that every 10 years we have to count the total population of the United States. And this time it's 2020 and we will be counting everyone. Um, our goal is to count everyone once, only once and in the right place. Um, so this is, um, you know, uh, many people um, think that, okay, I am not going to participate because um, I don't want to share my personal information with the federal, uh, with the government. And, you know, it's under Title 13 that all the information that we collect from people is confidential. Um, it's in Title 13 and, you know, anyone that violates that um, gets either five years of prison, $250,000 of fine, or both. So everyone that's worked for the Census Bureau takes an oath to protect that confidentiality. So why do we need to collect um, the information, how many people we have in the country, what, what is the purpose? So based on the population, you, uh, federal government provides $675 billion to the states. So um, um, according to 2010 census, New York State gets $53 billion every year. And we all know that that's not enough. And also the House of Representatives gets selected based on the census number. We um, lost seats and you know, we are 
we are afraid that we might lose more seats if we don't participate, and which is not a good thing for us. So you know, this, this is very, very important why we need to participate. Um, and where, okay, so where, where does these funds go to? You know, these $675 that we're talking about. You know, our health insurance, Medicaid, Medicare, our Title I school funding, um, our fixing our roads, um, the WIC program, the food stamp, um, SNAP program, TNAF, um, hospital improvement, all of those money comes to the state based on the census number. You know, someone, uh, I, was, uh, I was just in an um, e event um, the other day and someone said their fire department, fire um, place, you know, they're thinking of closing. You know, census number is very important to make sure that there's a fire station in every neighborhood where if there's a fire, you know, it can, can come quickly. But if we don't show how many people live in that community, we, you know, they might take it away, thinking like, oh, they don't need it. You know, um, so, you know, these are the things that, you know, our school children get their lunch based on the census number. You know, that's, that's very, very um, important. So what is different in this census? This time around, this is the first time in history of um, census collection we are going online. So people can fill out their form online. Um, they can also fill out their form um, by phone. They can do it on paper, and if they still don't do it, then we send people knocking on the door, which is a very, very expensive way of collecting data. And we're trying to minimize, and it's, um, anyone can fill out the census from, from their smartphone, um, from their laptop. You know, while you are waiting for a grocery um, in the line, you can fill out your census form. And nobody will, you know, a lot of people don't like people knocking on the door, um, so it's convenient. You know, you are going somewhere, um, riding, and you can fill out your census form. Um, and then also we have, um, we have language services. We have um, census, um, anyone can fill out, actually the next slide will show it better. So we have, um, if you see the purple, um, I'm sorry, we did, we, I couldn't make um, the, slide, the uh, handouts in color because we, didn't have, we ran out of color ink, I'm sorry. <laughs> but um, here you can see the um, purple um, uh, side, those are the 12 languages. People can fill out the census form online and on telephone. So in March of 2020, everyone will receive a postcard in their house with the link where they need to go and fill out the form. Also, they will have um, telephone lines where next to the telephone line, it will tell you what language. So when they call somebody who speaks Chinese or who speaks um, Korean, you know, the person will pick up the phone and they can fill out the census form. Um, and um, also, we will have the outside languages that you see. Those are the languages we will have um, uh, brochures available. We will have videos available. So whoever does not know how to fill out the form, they can watch the video or um, read the brochure and um, fill out the census form. And um, um, so, so if they still don't do it, you know, on the phone, um, on, online, um, paper form, then we send people in the house. So there's four ways people can fill out the census form. Um, so what we're doing now, um, we are actually um, doing outreach to make sure people know it. We, act we did our ad address canvassing. We, we started our um, updating addresses. So every household will receive a postcard, but in order to do that, we have to make sure that our, we have the correct address list. So what we did um, last year, we sent our, um, our um, address list, our master address to, list to the counties, and where they updated, they told us if there is a new building, um, if there is a, you know, a conversion of a house, uh, or if there was a demolition. You know. So we update on our side to match it with um, the city. And then also after that, we also send people on foot to check. You know, if there is a two-family house, but if we see there is four bells, uh, meaning like somebody is renting the basement or they have somebody living upstairs, we want to make sure that instead of sending two um, postcards, we want, we want to send four postcards. So make sure everyone receives the um, notice. So this is what we will start um, actually um, later this year. People will go to the neighborhood and check um, the, um, the addresses. Um, the other thing we are doing now is we are opening up census offices. So there will be 13 additional census offices in New York City. 
One of, we will have them in two waves. Wave one, we will have two offices, one in North Bold, Brooklyn and one in South Bronx. And then um, um, end, end of summer this year, we will have the um, 11, um, 12 other offices. So there will be four in Brooklyn, four in Queens, two in Manhattan, two in the Bronx, and one in Staten Island. So you know those offices, we um, will do the operation. So this time around, it's uh, mostly like um, sending the work in the smartphone, the, the you know, murders that will work, work or you know, um, doing the operation. It's not going to be an office where people can come in and fill out the census form. Um, so also, the other thing we started is hiring. Um, we are paying actually in New York City $25 an hour for the enumerators and $27.50 for our field supervisors. So we need to hire a lot of people to do this job. You know, we are, um, we, you know, these jobs can be part-time. If anyone have full-time job, they can also work part-time. You know, we are, um, you know, we need people to work on the weekends and on the afternoons. So, you know, um, evenings when people are home. So, you know, these are the things we need your help. We need to hire people from the community because people know who lives there, who lives next door, and the people trust them. You know, um, and maybe they speak the same language as the, as the people in the community. So you know, we want we want to partner with organizations and uh, you know agencies like we have here, um, where they can help us recruit with the recruitment. And you know, we will we will have actually um, advertisement where we um, focus different ethnic groups. So uh, you know, we will have a media buy um, later on this year. Um, and then the, um, you know, March, you will get the postcard, and we want everyone to fill out the postcard, um, po fill out the census form. And then in, in late May, we will start sending people home um, uh, to knock on the door to collect the forms if people do not participate on the phone or on online. And then, um, you know, in December of 2020, we send the um, number to the President of the United States. We do not send any personal information, just the number in certain geography. So these are the location of the area census office that we'll be opening. Um, um, so the, as I said, you know, two in, uh, one in um, North Brooklyn and one in South Bronx. And you know, the offices I was talking about before, um, we will have these positions that we are looking for. Some of these positions are professional, means um, they will have to go to usajobs.gov where they will apply. These are salary-based positions. They comes with benefit and you know, all the benefits that a federal employee regularly gets. You know, the, even though these are temporary positions, they do get all of the benefits. So um, people like myself, you know, we uh, they, we will have actually 75 other partnership specialists like myself who will different, who will speak different language, who will work with different geography, who will um, who will work with different ethnic groups. So we are bringing those uh, partnership specialists on board now, and uh, you know we will continue. We will need um, area office manager, um, admin manager, you know, different kind of position. Those are actually some of the managers get $42 an hour. And you know, um, as I said, you know, field workers get 25 to 27 dollars an hour. And um, the websites um, for the census job is 2020census.gov/jobs. Um, on the on the handouts, you have the link, so anyone can go online now and fill out, uh, fill out the census form to be um, to work on the census. It will be good until September of 2020. So once they're on this on the system, whenever we need them, we will call them to work. Um, in their area. So we know that, you know, um, census, we are in a very difficult um, condition now. You know, there's a lot of distrust with the government. People um, live in different housing conditions. You know, people are afraid. Um, and in, in on, on average, you know, people all over the world don't like to participate in survey. You know, there is so many surveys going on. People just, you know, we get calls all the time. So we want to make sure that, you know, people don't think that this is just another survey. You know, our, our daily life, our living condition ba is connected with this survey. We want to, um, we need your help. You know, I, I am working very closely with the community boards in Queens. We, we're doing presentations. Um, so, you know, I see a lot of community boards here. You know, we want to 
make sure that we reach out to every community boards in Brooklyn and making sure that you know those people know about the importance of census. Um, and uh, you know, um, there's a diverse population, immigrant population. Language is a problem. So you know, we we are coming to you to get your knowledge, your expertise. Tell us, you know, what's the problem and how we can work it together. So you are the you're the trusted voice, and you know, the the partners that we are reaching out to is elected officials. We are reaching out to schools. Um, colleges, um, libraries, you know, since this time it's an online, we need a lot of help from um, organizations that have computers, um, you know, because people can fill out their online um, form online. So we are partnering with libraries, you know, making sure if somebody does not have internet, they can go in the library and fill it out. You know, um, one of the, one of my uh, concern is the senior citizens. You know, a lot of senior seniors might not know how to fill out the form online, you know. So if you know a senior center um, and you let us know that, you know, this is a, you know, can, can Census Bureau come in and collect the data for the seniors here, we can do that. You know, we can send our census representative at the senior center and um, they can collect the information there, um, you know, um, to help them. Um, we, we are reaching out to elected officials, government officials. Um, we, are, um, we are posting stuff on the media. And you know, for media also, we can um, just send them the information and they can just post it. You know, they don't have to do any thinking. Um, local businesses and committee boards, I said it, you know, it's very, very important because you are the trusted voice of the community. Um, so one of the initiatives, you know, we have many initiatives. You know, we reach out to faith-based organizations, LGBT community, um, the businesses, um, and we are asking people to form a complete count committee. I'll talk about a li um, little bit later what's a complete count committee. Um, and, you know, higher education program. You know, college students will be a great asset for the recruiting. You know, and they have knowledge of the computers, you know, to um, how to um, operate those uh, smart uh, phones or tablets. So how do we support our partners? Um, so we can provide you with languages, um, come to the organization, do a presentation like we are doing today. Um, we can provide you with social um, drop-in articles. Um, we can have a table at the event. So if you know any, any organizations where you think it's good um, to have a census table, we will come there. Job fairs, you know, any, anything that's going around where we can connect with people, please let us know, we'll be there. Um, Okay, so what's a complete count committee? Complete count committee is um, each community board can have a complete count committee. So um, they can take the lead and making sure whatever is in that geography, in that geography of the community board, a faith, a church, a school, um, a library, you know, a, a, a ethnic organization, they can come together and make sure that all the all of the people that they represent participate in 2020 census. So you know, taking coming to the you know, it, it doesn't have to be a separate and, and census bureau does not regulate how you do it. It's independent and all of everybody works voluntary. Um, you know, you come together. It could be a board meeting where you include census every every meeting and see you know how you can do uh, things to making make sure every geography is covered. You know, all everybody and that geography knows about census. Uh, you know, some of the things we can do. So this is, this is one of the initiatives we are taking this time around, Complete Count Committee. And you know, if anybody wants to form one, we have a guide and a training how to um, work with that. We can provide the, all of those for free. Um, so I talked about these. Okay, so um, I, I provided a map of Brooklyn, actually. Um, and we have a tool called um, Rome where you can see um, the areas, the areas in dark blue, those are the areas people do not participate. Um, so in 2010, um, if you see the response score, it's 30%, meaning like 30% of the people do not participate in census. So what happens if people don't participate? We don't get any money for that area. So you know that's why we need to focus on those areas. This is what we are going, uh, we are taking that as our tool um, to guide us where to do our outreach. But if you know somewhere else that does, it's not in the map um, and you think we should do outreach, please let us know. You know, we need your advice, we need your suggestions. You know, those are the areas, you know, that means we don't have funding for those areas that we're supposed to have. 
you know, we need to work on those areas, making sure that you know everybody in those areas participate. Um, and you know, it, it, go, it goes by track. So few blocks makes a track, and if you click that track, you can see um, you know the demography of that of the track. You know, how many people live in, what's their income. Um, you know, it's it's a tool that you know you can access yourself, you know, you can go to census.gov slash roam and play around with it and you can see your neighborhood, how it looks. You know, it gives you even satellite views of the neighborhood. Um, so we also have a program called the Data Dissemination Program um, where we provide the data for your community for free. So if you are interested in knowing how many single mother with, um, with um, earning of 30, $20,000 in your neighborhood if you want to do something about them. You know, if we want to know these kind of data, we provide that data for free. So we have a data dissemination program where um, people can come in from the Census Bureau and show you the data in your community or your interest. You know, a lot of people, when they ask for a grant, they use this data. And, you know, there are many, many uh, organizations that sell this data. And we provide, you know, they're mostly census data, and we provide those data for free. So if, you, if any one of you need um, that information, Information, you know, we I have I'll have the contact for the data dissemination person. They can come in and show you the picture of your community. Um, and we are on social media. Um, and if you want to post something in social media regarding census, please let us know. We will send you the information, and you can just post it. Um, this is my contact and our data dissemination uh, program um, um, data specialist pro uh, name. Um, so if you have any organizations or anywhere you think we should go talk to the people or you see any opportunity for um, forming a complete count committee, please let us know. We need your help, your expertise, your trusted voice to do this. And you know, New York, we all live here and we want all the funding to come into our so state. You know, we lost, lost seats and Texas gained seat. You know, we don't want to do that again. You know, so we are urging everyone to please, you know, um, uh, apply for the census jobs and also you know, participate in census and next year uh, when you get the um, postcards. Thank you so much for your time. Anybody have any questions? Do you have any recruiting or hiring posters you can send to my office? Yes. I'm housed in a college and I'm sure they'd love the opportunity. Definitely. So if you leave me your, um, give me your um, email, I'll send you. Great, um, thank you. Mm -hmm. Any? Good morning, Celeste Leon, District Manager, Board 4, that represents Bushwick. There are a lot of concerns in the immigrant communities about filling out the census. What is the Census Bureau strategy for responding to this? So we are looking for the trusted voice that the immigrant population will um, will trust. You know, we are um, trying to partner with them uh, because definitely they will if they if they have a trust issue they will not trust us going to their community um so um maybe a faith-based organization where they go to worship you know that you know if the pr uh, priest um, or the pastor says something they might um understand it better than us telling them um so you know um or some of the programs that they go to where they can get help um, you know, um, those are the organizations we want to partner. And making sure, you know, we have a partnership specialist who speaks their language. Um, sometimes that, um, that helps um, uh, with the, with the um, anxiety. Yes. Go ahead. Um, I know that the uh, mayor's office has launched a count mm -hmm. Are you guys working with that at all? Yes. Yes. So mayor's office is, did form a complete count committee. New York State actually formed a complete count committee. Um, so you know we are working together with them, um, making sure that you know uh, the NYCHA buildings. You know we are working with them to make sure that we um, cover all the NYCHA buildings and you know the people there do participate. Any other? Any other questions? Okay, thank you, Zakir. Thank, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, so don't think we have any old business or new business. Um, any suggestions for our new, uh, our, our next full service cabinet meeting, which will be Tuesday, April 9th? I actually, could we do just a little bit of old business? I just want to make sure that mm -hmm. everybody knows that um, I, um, some of us have had conversations with uh, Noel Hidalgo about the CRM, mm -hmm. and um, I'm supposed to speak to him on Friday. We can make that a conference call if other people want to jump on. So I'm going to talk to him Friday at 11 before we go to the 12 o'clock conference call with uh, Councilmember Cabrera. Um, 
and he is in conversation um, with the mayor's office's legal team in order to draft a contract that should be um, um, good to go. Okay, so that was my old business because we.